are mindful that this is Easter. Uh, this is Resurrection Sunday. We've got a number of people away. Pete and I are away on a much-deserved break and a few others uh, that are not here this morning. But, you know, the main thing is that you and I are here and the presence of God is here. God is here this morning, and uh, we're going to trust God that he will speak to us through the teaching and the preaching of the word. So it's Resurrection Sunday, all right? Uh, and so um, at this time of the year, uh, or what we call at least in our you know, Christian calendar, we commemorate uh, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, on the Jewish calendar, they call this time of the year the Passover. They talk about the Passover festival, uh, and it ties in with the Feast of Unleavened Bread. If for those of you that are understanding the Jewish feasts and so forth. But you know, in the world, they just call it Easter. Um, in the world, they talk about Easter bunnies, Easter eggs, and all of these other things. But we're talking about Jesus Christ here today. All right. Um, and I wonder if I can have that remote control. I'm getting a blast of cold air into my neck that is not so good for me. <laughs> Right now. <laughs> Praise God. Thank you. Hallelujah. There you go. Fix that. All right, so let me read to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, and if you haven't got an outline in your hand, just raise up your hand and somebody will get you one. The scriptures are in the outline and they will also be on the screen behind me. I want to just uh, cover a few things this morning, remind us of them, some things that we already know and possibly look at some new things. Uh, and then a little bit later on, we'll have the children come in. Uh, we will also be uh, sharing communion together very shortly. So here in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, it says, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. All right, Christ is our Passover Lamb. So, in the in the in the Jewish mindset, uh, in the in the in Judaism, as a as a as the Old Testament religion, if you like, it's Passover. All right, and uh, Passover. There's a whole concept that I wish we had time to get into. It. It's very exciting because the Passover Lamb was killed when the Israelites were in Egypt, and they applied the blood of the Lamb on the doorposts and on the lintel of the house. And when the destroyer, the angel of destruction went through uh, Egypt to kill the firstborn in every household. When he saw the blood on somebody's doorposts, he passed over. That's why it's called passed over. And friends, for you and I as believers, Christ is our Passover. His blood has been applied in our lives. And there's no more judgment, no more destruction for you and me. There's only heaven that's waiting for us. All right. And so that's kind of the concept there. And also, I believe that what's most important for us to understand, it says Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. He hasn't been sacrificed for himself. He's been sacrificed for us. And in the whole deal with, with sacrifices, it's something or somebody dies on behalf of some, some, somebody else. All right. And all the Old, Old Testament sacrifices, all the lambs, everything that was sort of sacrificed up, they were all types and shadows towards the sacrifice called Jesus Christ. And when John the Baptist was down by the River Jordan and he was baptizing people, and many of you know the story, and he saw Jesus Christ come towards him to be baptized, and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Wow, how powerful is that? All right, and this is what we are celebrating at this time of the year. So it's all right to get a little excited this morning because this is the crux of the matter. This is the very foundation of the Christian faith. So for the last 2,000 years, the gospel of Jesus Christ has been preached around the world, proclaiming the good news. And that's what the word gospel means. It means good news of his sacrificial death, his burial, and his glorious resurrection. I want to read here from Mark's gospel, chapter 16. Um, and here in verse 1 and 2, uh, it says, Saturday evening, when the Passover had ended, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salom went out to purchase burial spices so that they could anoint Jesus' body. Very early on, on Sunday morning, just at sunrise, they went to the tomb. But when they arrived, they looked up and saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled aside. And when they entered the tomb, they saw a young man clothed 
in white robe sitting on the right side. And the women were shocked, but the angel said, do not be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Look, he, here is where they had laid his body. Now go and tell his disciples, including Peter, that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there just as he told you before he died. And so here we're reading from uh, the end of Mark's gospel. And in fact, in, in the gospels, in all four gospels, actually, um, the last few chapters recount the last few days of the earthly life of Jesus Christ. All right, we've got Gospel of Matthew, Gospel of Mark, Gospel of Luke, Gospel of John. The Gospels are basically a narrative of the life of Jesus Christ from his birth to the time that he went into ministry, all of his miracles, all of his teachings and so forth, and towards the end of his life, um, when the countdown towards his death began, um, and it's all described right there. And uh, the countdown towards his death began uh, should I say, began at his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. When uh, he sat on a donkey and he rode into Jerusalem and they were throwing palm branches into the streets and they were excited. He says, here, he says, Hosanna to the son of David. Here comes the king. And they were totally excited. And not two, three days later, they crucified him and hung him on the cross. It's amazing how crowds can be fickle. All right, that's why you and I, we don't run with the crowd. All right, we're not sort of crowd animals, so to speak. Um, and uh, his last days were filled with betrayal, with abandonment, court appearances, physical, mental, and emotional abuse before finally being hung on the cross. Betrayal, where one of his own disciples, where one of his own chosen people had actually betrayed him, abandonment, where all the others abandoned him, and he was utterly alone when they put him before various court sessions and accused him wrongly and condemned him to death. Uh, they, they abused him physically by beating him, plucking his beard out, pushing a crown of thorns on his head to mock him. And uh, so you talk about physical, mental, and emotional abuse before finally hanging or nailing him to the cross. And at some point in the afternoon when he had hung there for some time and agonizing, and the Bible also says that he made intercession for the transgressors, that before he died, he says, Father, forgive them. For, he says, they do not know what they're doing. It was all God's plan because he was the God-determined Lamb of God to be sacrificed for you and for me. But it wasn't pretty. And my goodness, what an ordeal to go through. And then finally, uh, in the afternoon, there was a, an earthquake. And the Bible says that Jesus looked up and he says, My Father, my Father, why have you forsaken me? Just amazing. And the Bible says then, uh, that Jesus also said, It is finished. Then he gave up his ghost, so to speak. He gave up, you know, his life, uh, and he died right there on the cross. It is finished, he said. What was finished? Well, his ministry on earth at that point was finished. That which he came to do was finished. The Old Testament and all the requirements, what the New Testament says, the handwriting that was all against us, it was all finished. It was all fulfilled. Jesus had now died for all the sins of all the people. And of course, they took his body down, laid it in the tomb. There was a, a disciple of Jesus called Joseph. He asked for the body to be released to him. And they put that, uh, his body into the tomb, rolled a large stone in front of it. And of course, now it's, Sabbath day, no work can be done. Um, and when Sabbath day had finished, the three women had bought some burial spices to, as it were, to embalm his body, and they went out to the tomb. And they found that by the time they got there, the stone had already been rolled away. 
And an angel said to them, he says, you're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. He's not here. He's risen. Go and tell. And here's the call for us to tell the good news. He says, go and tell. All right. And the amazing thing is that three women become the very first of all the human beings that have ever preached the gospel around the world. Three women preached the gospel first. They went back to the other disciples there. And of course, they didn't believe him believe them so they ran and looked in the tomb and uh, it's amazing that all the things that Jesus had taught them and talked to them about he says the son of man will die and uh, and then you know told them the whole deal they did not believe him it was amazing it was just amazing so here in Romans chapter 1 verse 3 it says it is the good news about God's son Jesus Christ our Lord who became a human baby, born into King David's royal family line, and being raised from the dead, he was proven to be the mighty son of God with the holy nature of God himself. And now, through Christ, all the kindness of God has been poured out upon us undeserving sinners. And now he's sending us around the world to tell all the people everywhere the great things that God has done for them, so that they too will believe and obey him. Wow. You know, the resurrection of Jesus Christ totally and utterly proved that he was indeed who he said he was, that he was the Son of God. There was a demonstration, there was a a validation of everything that he had said that it was indeed true. And, uh, you know, through his death or through Christ's death, God's kindness is now poured out upon all the people. Why not the judgment put out on all the people? Because the judgment was all laid upon Jesus Christ. And those who receive him as their personal Lord and Savior, the Bible says they've passed from judgment into life. For us as believers, there's no more judgment. All right. But of course, the judge is still coming. There will be judgment in the future for all those who are resisting Christ, who are rejecting him, there will still be judgment, but the reality is that they will not be judged for their sins as much as they will be judged for rejecting Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Just not interested, don't want to, uh, and uh, that's amazing. And he says, now God is sending us around the world to tell all the people everywhere the great things that God has done for them. That's why we call it the good news, that God is now offering eternal life. God is offering forgiveness of sins. God is offering access to heaven. And it is God's desire that people will believe the gospel and also obey. That's what he says here, that uh, he says, uh, he says, God has sent us everywhere to tell them the great things that God has done for them so that they too will believe and obey obey him. God is not willing, the Bible says, that any should perish. In God's mind, in God's plan, he wants everybody saved. But in the end, it is not God determined that determines who will get saved. It's you and me after hearing the gospel. Will we receive or will we reject? Here in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, he says, uh, Chapter 2, right, and in verse 3, it says, This is good, and it pleases God our Savior. He wants all people to be saved and to learn the truth. There is one God. There is also one mediator between God and humans, a human, Christ Jesus. He sacrificed himself for all the people to free them from their sins. This message is valid in every era. I was appointed to spread the good news and to be an apostle, to teach people who are not Jewish about faith and truth. I'm telling you the truth. I'm not lying. All right. So amazing how Paul the apostle says, look, God has appointed me to be an apostle to the non-Jewish people, to the Gentiles, to go out there, to tell them all of this good news. And he says, and I'm telling you the truth. He says, I'm not making this up. In Second Peter chapter 3, I just want to substantiate uh, that, uh, you know, people say, well, well God, why did God ever create hell? Well, he, hell was never created for people. It's created for, de- for the devil and for demons. Hell has not been created for, for people. All right. Yet in the end, those who are rejecting Christ, don't, who don't receive him, will still go there. 
So in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, it says that, that God, it says that he is not really being slow about his promised return, even though sometimes it seems that way. But he's waiting for the good reason that he's not willing that any should perish, and he's giving more time for sinners to repent. But the day of the Lord is surely coming as unexpected as a thief. This is the amazing thing, that Jesus told them that the Son of Man will come in his glory in the clouds. And, uh, and he says, no man knows the day nor the hour, not even the Son of Man. He, because uh, he told his disciples, says, the Father has put that, those times and seasons in his own authority. He says, even, even the Son of Man, he says, even I don't know when I'm coming. So it's like you can imagine this. So here is God the Father sitting in heaven on the throne, and, and at his right hand, Jesus sitting on his throne, and they're having a conversation. Because, you know, they, they do talk amongst each other more than just what's recorded in the Bible. And you can kind of imagine where Jesus says to the Father, he says, Father, when is it the time when I can come back and, you know, get the church out and when can I come uh, back to earth and set up my thousand-year reign? When is it going to happen? And the Father says, just wait a little bit more. I just want a few more people to repent. So this is the long suffering of God. He says, just wait a bit more. I want a few more people to repent. Just, just wait. But at a certain point, the time will come and the Father will turn to the Son and say, now is the time. I was going to it's a silly bird. It's like, Jesus, it's time to settle up. You know, the Bible says that uh, Jesus will come on a white horse. All right? And I don't mean to be sort of uh, <laughs> sacrilegious about these things, but Jesus, it's time to get on your horse, to get back to the earth. How amazing is that? And at that point, the time of salvation, the door has closed. And the time to get saved is now. Okay, when people hear the gospel, that's the time to get saved. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Don't put it off. Hell is filled with people that say it not yet. Tragic, absolutely tragic. So I'm going to quickly summarize and speak to you about the, the significance of Jesus' death, his resurrection, and his death and his resurrection from the dead. There are three absolute fundamental reasons why Jesus died on the cross. Just to summarize, and there are those three here. Number one, Jesus bore the sins of all of mankind and paid the penalty for our wrongdoings. Sin's no longer the problem. It's unbelief and rebellion against God. That's the problem now. And then number two, Jesus carried our sicknesses and he bore our pains. And number three, Christ Jesus became poor that we through his poverty might be made rich. Let me just quickly break that down, uh, share a few more scriptures, and then, then we'll, do, uh, we'll share communion together. But you know, in Isaiah chapter 53, Isaiah the prophet recorded what he saw uh, in his prophetic insight. You know, the Gospels... Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they recorded what people saw with their natural eyes. That here's Jesus born, he was dedicated, here he grew up, he, here he, he, you know, he came and he came to, uh, to his hometown and he stood up and he, he went into his public ministry that lasted some three and a half years. Here is all his miracles, here is all his teaching, and then here's what happened when they hung him on the cross and when he died and then they laid his body in the tomb. But Isaiah was able to see into the realm of the Spirit and he recorded what took place in the realm of the Spirit. Uh, number one, or letter A, Jesus bore the sins of mankind and he paid the penalty for our wrongdoings. Again, Isaiah 53 verse 5. It speaks of Christ. It speaks of the, the suffering servant. It speaks of the Messiah. It's all reference to Jesus Christ. It says he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. See, Jesus didn't die for his own sins. He didn't have any. He was the perfect Lamb of God. He was the perfect sacrifice and needed to be. Um, so it says he was pierced for our rebellion. 
And in Isaiah 53, verse 12, it says that he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. You see, people that naturally looked at Jesus when he hung on the cross, they didn't see sins being laid on him. They only looked with their natural eyes. But Isaiah the prophet looked forward in time and he saw what took place in the realm of the spirit that every single sin that had ever been committed in the past that was being committed at the time and all the future sins that were going to be committed was all bundled up and all laid upon Jesus Christ. And uh, he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. That is, we said before that when he hung on the cross, he says, Father, he says, forgive them. He says, they do not know what they're doing. And in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9, it says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. He died for everyone. Now, that doesn't, that doesn't mean that everyone will go to heaven, but he died for everyone. He paid the price for everyone. And the Bible tells us in John's gospel, he says that he came to his own, he came to the Jewish nation, which was his own nation by covenant. He came to his own, but his own did not receive him. But to as many as received him, John chapter 1, verse 12, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God. And the key is in receiving him as our personal Lord and Savior. That's why we say not so much, uh, you know, are you a Christian? Are you a Christian? Do you go to church? It's, the question is, have you received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? That's the question. So now our Heavenly Father is able to forgive our sins because Jesus Christ actually bore our sins sacrificially, and he went to hell on our behalf. Then secondly, or let it be, Jesus carried all of our sicknesses and bore our pains. In Isaiah 53 verse 4, it says, Yet he himself bore our sicknesses, and he carried our pains. But we in turn regarded him stricken, struck by God, and afflicted. Um, so what we need to understand is that salvation is available today because of what Jesus Christ has done. But bodily healing is also available because of what Jesus Christ has done. When they laid those stripes to his body, and somebody said once that, uh, you know, in the Old Testament they had a law, uh, that people were not allowed to be ripped with, you know, with, 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 with rips, uh, more than 39 times, so they called it 40 save one. Um, that was the maximum. And they say that Jesus Christ received 39 stripes. Well, that's a nice story. But you see, Jesus wasn't whipped by the Jews. He was whipped by the Romans who had no such law. They whipped and they kept on whipping. And the Bible says that his visage was more marred than any man. When they hung him on the cross, it was just a mess of flesh hanging there with skin virtually removed. And he went through that whole ordeal so that you and I could be healed today because all of our sicknesses, all the sins, all the sicknesses and all the pains were laid upon him. He carried those things sacrificially so that God's goodness now in healing our bodies and healing our minds for that matter, healing us mentally and healing us emotionally is all available because of what Jesus Christ has done. And quickly now, um, here in Matthew chapter 8, verse 16, it says, When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and Jesus cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, he himself took our infirmities and he bore our sicknesses. And sometimes, you know, people have said, well, that, that whole thing is just all spiritual. It's all spiritual. It does not mean physical. Well, Jesus physically healed people. All right? So it absolutely means physical healing. It absolutely means 
bodily healing. It means emotional healing. It means healing in any area of our life, wherever we need it. All right. And in Isaiah 53, verse 5, it says that he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we were healed. By the wounds that they laid on Jesus' body, it's by those wounds that healing was purchased for us today. So as we reach out to God and receive our healing today by faith, God will not withhold it. Praise God. And let us see, last point now, Jesus became poor that we through his poverty might be made rich. You know, sometimes there's a disservice done by Bible scholars that try to spiritualize everything. And say, well, that, you know, that, like they say, you know, with healing, say, well, they just wanted to heal your spirit. Well, yeah, he wants to heal our spirit, but he wants to heal our body. He wants to heal our emotion. And the same thing is true when it says that, uh, in fact, let me read here from Isaiah 53, verse 5. It says, the chastisement needful to obtain peace and well-being for us was upon him. That's why he's called the sacrifice. That's why he's called the Lamb of God. That everything that was due to us was laid upon him so that we could go free. And, uh, and, and again, without uh, you know, t- spending too much time, in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, it says that Jesus became sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. The greatest transaction of all humanity took place at the cross. When all of our sins were laid upon him, not only did he carry them, but he became sin personified. And then his righteousness is laid upon us the moment we surrender our lives to him. How good is that? There ought to be like a rush. Oh, can I please get saved too? There ought to be a rush. That's how good the the, the news is. So the word peace here in the Hebrew language, it comes from the Hebrew word shalom. And of course, shalom is a greeting. And amongst the Hebrew people, Jewish people, they say shalom. And they said, well, it means peace. Well, it means that, but it means much more than that. It means welfare. It means success. It means prosperity. So when Jewish people greet one another and they say shalom, they say well-being, Success to you, prosperity, and just all around, welfare to you. Second Corinthians chapter 8, verse 5, it says, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. I know that there is teaching around to talk about poor Jesus, you know, walking the shores of Galilee, oh, poor Jesus. But, you know, he took 5,000 people out for lunch. Um, poor people don't do that. He wore nice clothing. Wherever he traveled, he was able to, you know, to take care of things. He, he wasn't poor, but he became poor when they finally captured him and they stripped him right down. When they hung him on the cross, And again, I don't mean to be sacrilegious, but, you know, all he had on him was his loincloth, what we would call today underpants. They stripped everything else away. They took it all all away from him. And that was done sacrificially. So that in God's mind, that when Jesus hung on the cross, he not only carried our sins, our sicknesses, but he also carried our poverty. He was just completely stripped down. That you and I today, through his poverty, might be made rich. These are all blessings that are included in the salvation package. But the most important thing is to get saved so you go to heaven. Healing is wonderful. And it demonstrates the goodness of God. Prosperity is wonderful. In fact, sometimes people are very prosperous without God. They think, I'm already doing well. God's blessing is on my life. And I say, well, that's fantastic. But you're still going to go to hell if you don't surrender your life to Jesus Christ. Because the Bible says, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and still loses his own soul? We have a salvation prayer printed on the outline there. I'd really urge you to pray this prayer from the bottom of your heart um, as soon as you can. And remember, 
If you're not saved, you're not promised tomorrow. There's no absolute guarantee that we're going to be around tomorrow or the day after. You know, the Bible speaks of the rapture of the church. Next minute, the church is taken out uh, um, just before the second coming of Jesus Christ. There's a lot of things that are going to go down very, very soon. Um, and the time to get saved is always now. Romans chapter 14, verse 9, it says, The reason Christ died and rose from the dead to live again was so that he would be Lord over both the dead and the living. You know, the question there, and again, it's in your outline because these are urgent things. These are important things. Is Jesus Christ your Lord yet? And if he is your Lord, is he still your Lord? Because people that backslide, Jesus Christ is no longer their Lord. The time to get saved is today. The time to walk with the Lord day by day, hour, hour by hour is, is today. Have you received him as your personal Lord and Savior? And if not, you should really pray this prayer. And if it's a, a prayer of recommitment, then recommit your life to Jesus Christ and walk with him every day. And if you've never done so before, all the more, commit your life to him to make sure that you're thoroughly saved. Jesus says you must be born again.